So in the studio here, I have Tricia and Daniel, and we're going to talk about something exciting as Java in the cloud and Java in general, and then some. So um, first of all, I'd like to um, hear a little bit about your background. Hello. Uh, yes, yeah, so I am a developer advocate for JetBrains. I was a Java developer for 15, 20 years, something scary like that. Um, I sort of have a traditional background of computer science and then um, being a developer in enterprises um, and startups and then became a developer advocate because it's kind of fun to go to conferences mm -hmm. and talk to people and meet people and tell people all the cool stuff that you've learned. Yeah, so hi everyone, my name is Daniel Bryant. I work uh, with a company called DataWire now, uh, with Kubernetes tooling and, and uh, the Ambassador API Gateway. It's the, the nice t-shirt here. Uh, my background, kind of similar to Trish, I was a Java developer for many years. I started actually as an academic as well. Um, so I've done a bunch of roles over the years, but these days kind of more focused on startup kind of things, entrepreneurial ideas, um, and helping developers to do the best work possible with all these crazy new things like the cloud and containers and bits and pieces. So why Java? Java is still the, the biggest uh, language in the world, um, and I think 16% uh, of all uh, developers, they use Java, so it's, it's, it's huge, and it's by far number one. I mean, we don't have that long to talk about why Java, but I guess one of the reasons why Java is that it is used by a lot of people, so it ends up having that momentum. It's used in a lot of places, a lot of enterprises. There are a lot of Java developers, so people do Java applications because there are plenty of Java developers, and then because there are plenty of Java applications, people train up to learn Java because they'll always be working in that area. But having said that, other large languages have declined in the past when they become not fit for purpose. So Java as well continues to evolve to be fit for purpose in terms of certainly enterprise development and more and more around sort of startups and, and lean type enterprises, I think. Yeah, to be honest, I agree completely on that one, Trish. I think the interesting thing with a lot of technologies we've got these days, we've got such a broad choice. Like when I was growing up in like the 80s, kind of like it was you know super basic hardware, like basic or assembly were my choices of learning languages. These days you've got so many options and I still think you know, even though Java is evolving, I even look back at, say, Java 8 or Java 5 even, and like most of the stuff I actually want as a developer is kind of there in the platform. It's just that there is other languages coming up through, like Go, say, um, you know, even kind of the resurgence of Python and so forth. They often have good, good kind of different sort of fits, if you like. Python is really good like, with its library support around machine learning, AI and so forth. But I think Java is a really solid language for general purpose programming. Um, it's quite easy to read. You certainly can create hard to read Java, but I've seen like Scala, for example, is even worse. Uh, I've done Prolog in the past and Haskell. That stuff's really hard to understand sometimes. So I think Java is a real nice sort of glue kind of programming language, fit for the enterprise, fit for general purpose, mashing together other technologies, I think, as well. And I also wanted to mention, of course, it's not just Java, of course, it's the JVM. So the JVM platform allows us to use things like Scala, uh, Kotlin, of course, from oh, JetBrains. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's the nice thing about the JVM, is that you don't just have to rest restrict yourself to Java the language. If you decide Java the language is a little bit old-fashioned or doesn't have what you want, you can um, pick up like Clojure or, yeah. um, or Scala or Kotlin. And of course, with a lot of the interoperability of the, of the JVM, you get the language support. And um, with, uh, even though you're using different languages, you get languages and libraries that you can glued together yeah. with your different JVM languages. So it's very multi-purpose, I think. I want to add that uh, actually um, Java was more or less in the beginning uh, there to fix the problems with um, issues with C++ and C. And they're actually, the, together they are actually even a bigger language if you combine C and C++. So Java and C and C++ is actually dominating um, the, all the development world. Um, so. Now, now Java is, uh, you know, turning 25 and or around that time, and um, so how up to date is is uh, Java with the latest innovations and ideas in software engineering? So Java is always going to be a little bit behind. It's not going to be the most bleeding edge because of the stability, because it is used. One of the great things about Java is the fact that it's, it's used in a lot of places, and the stewards of Java want to make sure that they retain backwards compatibility. They don't want to break everything by moving too fast. They don't want to introduce major changes. So some of the things that developers moan about that Java doesn't <laughs> support um, are kind of like that for now until um, they can find a way to fix them in a way that won't break everything else. So Java's always going to be a little bit behind. Um, I believe, and I believe that's one of the strengths of the language. Um, but it is also it's moving increasingly fast with the six monthly release cadence. Um, it means that instead of like having a big bang release every two, three years, we get a small steady drip of features every six months if we want to move to that sort of cadence. So it is, um, it is moving 
probably at the same speed. It's just that we get more frequent releases. Yep. So that's useful. We get stuff. We don't have to wait for three years to get the next release. Yeah. And the other thing is, like I mentioned about the other JVM languages, is that Java can borrow from some other JVM languages. If something seems to work in Kotlin or Scala or, or Clojure or whatever, then um, that can get folded back into the language. It's a nice way to sort of prototype. That's not really very fair on the other languages, <laughs> but it's a nice way to try out new stuff. And you can still try out those new features in a different JVM language if you want. Mm. So yeah, it's, kind of, it's not the most bleeding edge of, of, lang of languages, but I think it's I think it strikes a decent balance. Mm. It's quite funny, like so I'm I'm quite a hipster when it comes to like tech in terms of like containers and like you know and all that kind of thing and cloud tech. But I'm actually quite like a sort of a, a sort of pragmatist when it comes to Java. I think Java's a really good language. And in some ways, like you don't need to change everything, if that makes sense. And I think bingo is exactly what you said, Trish. Like Kotlin, for example, has got some amazing semantics for writing certain things. And to be honest, as a Java developer, learning Kotlin is not super challenging. So if I really want to do this kind of like different programming model, I think learning Kotlin rather than complaining about the Java framework, not or Java uh, platform, sorry, not supporting something, probably better use of my time to learn Kotlin. So I, I've got, I think in some ways, Java's got to the point where it really can do pretty much everything we want it to. Yes, there's always cool things we can borrow from Go or from Python or whatever, but I guess I'm a little bit old and jaded these days. Like, I, I think, why? Like, as in, if I really want to use Go, let's just use Go. And we're all building modular systems these days, like modular in the JVM, but we're also building modular systems in terms of microservices, these kind of things. So um, there's nothing stopping you spinning up a Go service that chats to a Java service, in my opinion. So I, I like Java. And I, I like to see it change. I'm totally cool with that. But like, it's not a deal breaker if it doesn't change for me, personally. So the past year, uh, something that has caused some, some waves and turbulence in, in, the, in the community is, is the new Oracle license model. And uh, maybe you can just comment briefly on that. I can try and comment briefly on that. Um, <laughs> as of Java 11, Oracle has changed its licensing for Java. Um, and what that means is if you are using the Oracle uh, JDK, which a lot of us are, we need to be aware that we shouldn't just by default be using the Oracle JDK for Java 11 and onwards and putting it into production. Mm -hmm. Because if you're using the Oracle commercial JDK and put it into production, you will have to pay for that. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that Java is automatically paid for. It means that um, there are multiple JDKs to choose from now, and you need to understand the different licensing from the different vendors, yeah. the different release cadence. It, it's complicated, but um, it's complicated, so I don't really want to give like the, the TLDR. I do talk <laughs> about it in my talk in Go to Amsterdam tomorrow. Um, <laughs> if you are going to use Java 11 onwards, um, it is important to understand the licensing has changed, and you do need to do your research around that. Yeah, I don't think I can add too much more on that one, Trish. Um, I think the, the key things are, in some ways, I totally get why Oracle did it, because you know everyone's got to make money. This is the way the commercial um, world works. But at the same time, it has made it more confusing for us as engineers, I think. So um, choice is not always a good thing. I mean, like, I'm a massive fan of the Azul Zing and this obviously, of course, Adopt OpenJDK, building binaries. There's a lot of choice out there. But I do think we were chatting a little bit off camera earlier on. I think the key thing is to make sure someone in your team takes responsibility for understanding these options and the legal ramifications. It may even be worth talking to the lawyers in your company, dare I say it. Um, but not everyone, I think, should burden themselves too much. Java, the language is still free. The way you run it, the, the JRE in particular, in production, there is a few nuances around that now. Um, so I definitely would recommend like either, say, an architect or a team leader or CTO in the company, probably ultimately the CTO is taking responsibility, does a bit of homework, studies up, um, and makes the correct choice for everyone in the company. I, I did want to add something, though, because um, since Java 11, Oracle has made the, uh, Open JDK the same as the Oracle JDK. So it's, yes. the, it's the Open JDK, which is still free, Yeah. Um, but it only gets updates every six months. It, on the, oh, it's complicated, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, in the past, we always looked to Oracle's JDK. Now we should be looking, probably, if we want a free one, we should be looking at an Open JDK build. Probably. We are not lawyers, but, but I actually think that if, if we are as a community and we have some ideas on how to simplify things, I'm also sure that Oracle can change a few things because, I mean, it's also the first version of the new license model. And of course, if they, it causes some confusion, I'm, I'm sure they will listen. And, and if there are like millions of people coming against them, and I'm sure they will listen more. So, so, uh, so maybe let's try and, and, and see where the confusion is you know, over the next period of time. Let's jump to something else. Um, so um, it's up to date. It's a fairly modern language still. 
um, Java and containers. Um, any comments on that and how that goes together? Fundamentally, Java runs well in containers. Uh, again, everyone's moving to the cloud, um, VMs, containers, Kubernetes. Java, I still believe, is a good fit there. It's well worth um, doing some research. Again, it's probably our, our, sort of one of our common themes here is to do your homework. Um, as the platform you're deploying onto changes, you need to make sure you have um, mechanical sympathy, as Martin Thompson calls it. You need to understand, to a certain level, the platform you're deploying onto. Shameless plug, I have covered this in my book, Continuous Delivery with Java. Got to mention that one. But it's because the reason I've covered it is because I got burned with it. Um, Pre-Java, I think it's eight update 161, something like that. And the JVM was not fully respect, uh, fully in tune with the way containers um, restrict memory and CPU allowance, for example. It's all been fixed now from like Java 9 onwards, and then your Java, it's even been backported to Java 8 around one of the updates, worth a quick Google. And um, now the JVM, when it spins up, it realizes it's in a container and it configures itself correctly. Because we've got it, you know, the heritage of the, of the JVM of Java is fantastic, 25 years. Um, back when we were you know, starting up a JVM 25 years ago, the JVM assumed it had the whole machine it was deploying onto. Now we're kind of putting things in containers and we're putting multiple things on a single host. The JVM needs to understand that, that it's running in that kind of environment. So definitely a bit of stuff to learn. Many people like other than me as well have talked about this at GoTo, I think, other presentations. Sander Mack talks about this kind of stuff. There's plenty of stuff out there, but I think the key message for me is if you are going to move to serverless, cloud containers, um, just have a quick Google around, check what version of Java Java you're running and if any tweaks need to be made. I do want to add a little bit as a beginner around the Java container side. I was just I was just trying to learn Docker this week. It's shameful really. How many years has Docker been out? Um, no, it's because I'm an expert in Java. I don't need to know that. Um, and it's it's a little bit complicated and confusing really getting started. Um, but I think it's an area which is which is maturing and so tutorials and documentation are, are getting much better around that area. But I, I think the important thing for me when I was like Googling Docker and containers if you're looking at general documentation, that's not as useful as if, as if you're looking for Java, Docker, and containers, because yes. the way they all play together, as you say, yeah. it's important to understand how containers ap apply to your platform and, and your language. My final question to you is more open-ended. It's um, We talk a lot about the language, the skills, and the versions, but um, what other skills are very important, in your opinion, to be, to be a good developer and make great software? It's a, it's a great question. and. I think these days there's an expectation for developers to be sort of full stack and to learn many, many things. Um, and I don't think it's a bad thing, um, but at the same time, I think we do need to realize our individual limits. Not everyone can learn everything. Uh, it's just physically impossible, and we've also got certain strengths in certain areas. So uh, I think that one of the key things for me is, is kind of when you're young in your career or early in your career is find your niche, find where you're good, find where you're comfortable, um, find where you can make a big impact. And I work with some amazing engineers at DataWire who are really good at working really close to the metal, properly you know, building platforms and tools. Uh, I also work with some people that are really good at uh, talking about visions and leading teams. And we've really worked hard to make sure people are in the position where they can make the most impact. It, some developers just want to code, they just want to solve business problems, and there's definitely a place for that person. But as, if they're working closer to the business, I think we probably need stronger communication skills. Uh, less and less now, I think it's about raw coding at the kind of application level. It's more about gluing things together. Hey, I've got Spring Framework that does a bunch of cool stuff for me. I put my business logic in it, but I need to make sure that, that business logic is really going to add value to my customers. So I've, I'm, I'm very much a generalist, I guess, these days, like as much as I do close to the metal stuff with DataWire. But I, that, that's my niche. It works for me, but I really enjoy working with very deep specialists as well. So there's a place for everyone, I think, Trish. I get a bit irritated with the, the vision inside the industry and outside the industry that to be a developer, you have to be really good at one thing or really deep or possibly deep and broad in, mm -hmm. you know, but, and really good at everything. And that kind of irritates me because I think it puts a lot of people off because I think like generalists like you and I are like, well, it's nice to get to dip into those things mm -hmm. and learn them a bit, but it's nice to go over here and look at this. And I've got communication skills as well. I don't necessarily want to be sat in front of the computer the whole time. I think the industry has definitely changed in terms of things like um, full stack, not just doing back end stuff. It's important, probably a lot of developers have to know some JavaScript front end stuff and some HTML and CSS, and I'm talking from a Java developer point of view. And front end developers are starting to learn more back end stuff as well. There's more full stack stuff, there's more DevOps stuff. Yeah. Understanding, like a lot of developers when they first get into DevOps, operations is an entirely different thing. Having to understand how the command line works, having to understand what physical machines are there, what are the limitations, um, how do you, uh, maintenance, getting woken up in 
the middle of the night. <laughs> you know, yeah. these are things that I didn't have to worry about when I was an enterprise developer, like, you know, when I started. Um, but it's not just having that wide range of technical skills, it's also, as you say, the, the business skills, the communication skills. What does my customer want? When the business says to me, um, I need a button that does this, you should be asking them, what is that trying to achieve? What do the mm -hmm. end users want? What is the problem you're trying to solve? Because the, a junior is going to apply, just do the button, they're going yeah, to do what yeah. they're told, but a more senior developer is the sort of person who says, what do you want to do and why do you want to do it? Perhaps we can do it this way. Okay. Which is not just listening, it's also communicating why something might be a better vision, it's understanding the business, the users. So I think those skills are becoming more important for, for developers and I think developers who have this broad range of technical communication, business skills mm -hmm. are in my opinion, more likely to succeed, or there's more jobs for them, let's put it yes. that way, because there are more companies who want that broad range of skills. And so I think that we should stop as an industry, we should stop talking about developer skills and language skills and start talking more about how we are all people who have our niches and how different companies want different skill sets and different types of developers. And if you get rejected from an interview because you don't have a particular set of technical skills, there's a company out there that really wants you because you're you. Yes. And, and that's really important to understand, I think. And don't get put off just because some company or some conference or some, some, <laughs> someone doesn't want you because you are needed in this industry. Yeah. Thank you so much. Brilliant answers. Thank you so much for coming to this interview and to go to Amsterdam.